From there, we drove through Arizona. Daybreak, rising out of the desert, we saw something wonderful. These huge new solar plants, 50 square miles of reflectors. They hadn't been built soon enough to help Las Vegas, but one day, they were supposed to power the whole West Coast. It was comforting to know. There's tremendous possibility there. In the desert Southwest, there's a capacity to produce uh, solar power and, and move it to where the great population centers in the United States are. I think that it would be almost impossible to do this journey unless you had some form of intelligence as to what areas are lawless or dangerous. I don't think strangers are going to be very friendly. By the time we got onto Route 15, we were grimy and tired. The scene in front of us had jolted us out of our days. Hundreds of people packed the road, all of them streaming out of the southwest heading north. It felt like the Dust Bowl all over again. Think what it would be like if we have millions of neighbors to the south heading north because they don't have food and they don't have water. They shouted at us as we drove past. Molly was half out of the window, catching everything with her camera. Suddenly, a man grabbed her arm. He had a gun and pointed it at Molly's face. Get out of the truck right now, he yelled. I'd never been so terrified. But within seconds, two men from the convoy pulled their own guns, and the man melted back into the crowd. We knew now just how dangerous the border regions had become and how lucky we were to be headed east. Just as people were migrating, so too were the bugs. In Oklahoma, acres and acres of corn were threatened. To the degree that all ecosystems are extremely stressed by 2050, the pests will flourish. There's an arms race between breeding crops that are resistant to various pests and the pests themselves, because to the degree that we simplify our food system, we've also made it massively vulnerable. For decades, this had been predicted. These giant farms, which supplied so much of the world's food, were easy prey. People get their seeds from single or just a few manufacturers, and they're genetically very, very similar. So if, in fact, an agent were to come onto the scene that was capable of infecting one, it would rapidly spread. Halfway through Kansas, we split off from the convoy. They were headed north to Canada, we went east to Greensburg, Kansas, leaving the devastation behind. Welcome to the Greensburg Visitor Center. In 2007, a tornado destroyed our town. Out of the rubble came a dream. A town that was completely destroyed by a tornado but is being rebuilt as a global example of how clean energy can power an entire community, how it can bring jobs and business. This was a wonderful place completely self-sustaining. They had been one of the first, and they knew what they were doing. They got their power from the wind and sun, their water from the rain, and they grew everything they ate. Feeling a lot better, we hot-seated it the rest of the way. Compared to the Southwest, the fields were green and fertile. We saw some communities like Greensburg. We wish there were more. The closer we got to the end of our journey, the better we felt. The next day, we hit the outskirts of New York City. New York City is engaged in the greatest urban experiment of our time. From skyscrapers that grow their own food, to an all-electric vehicle fleet, to clean and tranquil parks. Inspired leaders and creative minds are working together to create an urban paradise. I looked across the George Washington Bridge at the skyline and felt a surge of hope. 
But underneath ran a trickle of worry. With all we had seen, maybe we had seen nothing yet. By the middle of the century, I thought I'd seen it all. Storms, migrations, and droughts that had destroyed whole cities. But I had also seen so much more. Brilliant people everywhere were working furiously to change our future. I had a family, and together I thought we might be equal to whatever came our way. But I had no idea of what the future would hold. It's a new world, and not a better one as we catch up with Lucy, our fictional storyteller. The year is 2060, past mid-century and into middle age for Lucy. At 51, she has grown up in a world of soaring population, dwindling resources, and intense climate change. The worst case scenario, imagined by some experts, is playing out. But there are signs of hope, a growing global movement led by cities like New York. New York is probably the most geographically favored city in America. Great port, rich fisheries around it, this wonderful river that allows transport and access to great farmland. It's a center of the arts. It's been a center of finance. I think it'll continue to be so. After what we had been through, New York was a fresh start. The city was full of hope and energy and promise. You'd walk down the streets and meet each other's eyes and see a sense of purpose. It was a great place to be a part of back then. The first years we were there were the best of our lives. Josh was working as an engineer on the Great Barrier Project. I was at Bellevue Hospital, a historic institution already more than 300 years old. The building we lived in was green in every sense of the word, and Molly worked in the gardens that grew our food. They were a part of the building itself. You're gonna see greenhouses, multi-story greenhouses, and each floor will be growing, you know, carrots and potatoes, etc. and that'll be just considered normal. The building supplied not just our food, but most of our own energy. Instead of having solar panels, big, heavy, bulky things, we can just put this thin film on rooftops, on window panes, and generate electricity that way. I rode my bike to work every day, a mere 30 blocks. We had designated bicycle lanes. The traffic was manageable, and you could breathe the air. All the vehicles were electric. You hook your car up to a mega transport system that will move you a good bit of the distance to your final destination, kind of a, a train of cars. And then you get disconnected from the mass combination transit and drive the last little bit yourself. Molly fell in love as quickly as her parents had. She married George, who was studying to become a botanist. A year later, my grandson Daniel was born. And a lovelier child I had never seen. It was a happy time. And when Molly told me they were moving upstate to work on a real farm, Josh and I understood. It had always been their dream. The city was getting a lot of attention, and money flowed in, both private and public. The biggest, and maybe the most important project, was my husband Josh's, since without the barriers, the city was at risk. It would be the biggest civil engineering project in US history. It'd be comparable to putting man on the moon. The project had been underway for years, and those who worked on it had a tremendous sense of pride. There were three barriers going up, one at the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, one at the top of the East River, and one in Staten Island at Batten Hills. You could see them rising a little every day. Sea level was rising, and without the barriers, big storms would flood the city. I think it'd be like in medieval times, people building a beautiful, huge cathedral. It took generations to build. 
and there was a great sense of purpose and gave purpose and meaning to life. The project drew thousands of people into the city looking for work. New York City was then, as it had always been, a beacon of hope. In New York, it'll be a magnet, as any viable city will be a magnet. These cities where people come to flee become petri dishes for diseases and new diseases and resistant forms of disease. There are a number of infectious diseases that are currently confined to tropical and subtropical areas that are likely to spread into temperate zones. And this is something that I'm very concerned about. Keeping New York safe from disease was crucial, and Bellevue was busy. I didn't feel as tired at the end of the day as I might have. We were doing important work, keeping a close eye on any new diseases. I remember the night I was called to the workers' camps in Flushing. A young Ecuadorian family had just arrived in New York, and they all had high fevers and blisters on their hands and feet. We sprung into action immediately, closed off the neighborhood, and called in the CDC. They knew right away they were looking at a new virus. We set up a mobile clinic at the camps, where we treated dozens of workers and their families. Everyone recovered, and the disease was contained. Imagine now the year 2070, and things are in danger of unraveling. Sea levels have risen nearly three feet, redrawing the map of the world. Island nations have disappeared, much of Bangladesh reclaimed by the sea, some of California's famous beaches gone, the Florida Everglades underwater. Now the richest countries are being forced to come up with innovative and expensive solutions. Lucy's husband, Josh, is one of the leaders. <laughs> Josh was an engineer on the Great Barrier Project. After 30 years in the making, it was nearing completion. Within a few months, they would be testing the massive gates. If I was the engineer in charge, I would be very nervous. But you would have practice runs, and during nice weather, you would say, all right, let's close the gates today and make sure everything's working right. It's not going to jam up. Josh was worried about something else, too. New York City's barriers, like others around the world, had been built on the assumption that sea level rise would be gradual. But it was becoming clear that might not be the case. Scientists say they are detecting a massive spike in the level of methane in the atmosphere. Climate in general doesn't change smoothly the way you know, we're used to seeing projections from climate models. We find that the transitions from warm to cold or cold to warm, some of those transitions can be really, really abrupt. Abrupt meaning within the time scale of a decade, or sometimes even less than a decade. We knew there were certain things that could rapidly turn up the heat, but we didn't know what that tipping point would be until it happened. Maybe the tipping point is you heat up the tundra and the permafrost so much that there's a huge burp of methane and carbon dioxide out of those northern soils. Methane is a very a big worry in my mind because it's some 23 to 30 times more potent than CO2. An enormous reservoir of methane produced by decomposing plants and animals lies buried beneath the frozen Arctic tundra. It has been there since the Ice Age. If the tundra thaws and a large quantity of the gas is released, global temperatures would soar. This is a bit like a light switch. You push the light switch a little bit, and nothing happens. You push a little bit more, and nothing happens. Then you push it a little bit more, and it flips completely to a new state. The methane emanating from the Arctic could raise temperatures worldwide. A panel of experts is convening to recalculate how warm the planet Drastically is. raise global temperatures. This is what specialists call a nonlinear flip or a nonlinear change. 
when that happened